Okay. Setting up your webinar for Facebook Live. Oh, here we go. Oh, I'm, I've probably been live for like a minute. Whoops. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. If you can hear us, which hopefully you can. Um, I'm Nora Henley. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications for the Spina Bifida Association. And I'm really excited tonight because we have one of our amazing medical directors, Dr. Tim Bry, here to do an Ask the Expert um, for parents of infants, children, and teenagers with spina bifida. Dr. Bry has been with us for a long time. Um, he's a developmental pediatrician. Well, you'll do that part, but he's also an adult with spina bifida. So he has a lot of professional experience and also personal experience. Um, so why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and then we'll get started with that first question. Okay, so um, as Nora said, I'm Tim Bry. I am a developmental pediatrician by training and a professor of pediatrics at Seattle Children's Hospital. Um, I've been, and I am an adult with spina bifida. Um, so um, my professional work um, on a day-to-day -day basis is working primarily with children and adolescents. Um, but I certainly am happy to try to answer some questions about um, the transition to adult care to the best extent I can. Um, and I'm willing to try to answer questions um, that may be a bit more personal um, that you may want to ask me. So we'll get going from there. Yes, and just for everybody watching or who's going to tune in, um, you can just ask a question in the comment on this live stream and I will relay it to Dr. Bry. That way we don't overwhelm him. Um, and if there's any overlap between questions, I can just merge them together that way. So somebody, somebody asked a question earlier on just to get him started about the MACE surgery. So it was about what exactly is the MACE surgery and why their teenager might actually be needing it. So if you want to jump in. So the MACE surgery is a surgical procedure which brings either the appendix or a portion of the colon up to the surface of the skin to allow for what we call um, an antegrade continence enema to be done. So uh, um, an ACE procedure helps to put in um, essentially uh, enema fluid, not up from the rectum itself, but actually throughout the large colon and flush it um, in a different kind of way. Um, not having all of the medical information about your child, I can't answer all of the specifics, but we would consider doing a, an ACE procedure or MACE. The M just stands for Malone, who developed one of the techniques. Um, but we would consider doing it in a child or an adolescent who perhaps um, had higher level motor function where doing their own bowel routine might be more physically challenging um, in terms of balancing on a toilet or doing peristine or doing suppositories or whatever that bowel management is. Um, so it's, I wouldn't say that it's an absolute necessity in most cases, but it becomes a very good option um, as a surgical procedure to help promote independent care uh, related to spina bifida. Okay, thank you. Um, I, this is really common. So I know a lot of people in our community might already know this, but somebody's asking about intermittent cathing and why it is important. So I think they're also asking what it is. Okay, so clean intermittent catheterization, uh, we abbreviate CIC, is actually one of the mainstays of uh, treatment in spina bifida. Um, with spina bifida, usually in 85 to 90 plus percent of the cases, um, the bladder is neurogenic, meaning that the nerves that control the bladder um, do not work appropriately. Um, and 
typically when you're going to, I'm not a urologist, so I won't get into the nitty gritty details of the nervous system. But typically when you want to hold your urine, you, you tighten the muscle at the neck of the bladder and relax the muscle of the bladder itself and vice versa if you want to urinate. Well, when the nerves are not working appropriately, that ability to hold urine or to control the muscles and do what they're doing is affected. So, so um, children may have a need for catheterization. Catheterization would be done for two major reasons. The first of which is sometimes the pattern of bladder dysfunction caused by the nerves is one that places the kidneys at high risk uh, due to high pressures in the bladder and low emptying in a bladder which is kind of continuously squeezing um, inappropriately. But the other reason to catheterize is uh, to control the timing of urination so that we provide some degree of functional continence um, and work toward a program of functional continence so that accidents aren't happening all the time. Um, and that becomes much more of a priority um, when children are reaching adolescence um, and are looking at adolescent development and dating and other kinds of activities going on. We, we don't want them to feel um, marginalized or not able to do things that other kids do just because um, they have urinary incontinence or fecal incontinence. So we think it's an important, it has a very important role in helping us develop again, functional continence where we minimize accidents um, and uh, both bladder continence and urinary, or both bladder incontinence and urinary, excuse me, urinary incontinence and fecal incontinence um, do appear to impact quality of life, particularly as kids move into teenage years and into adult years. All right. Um, what? <laughs> Uh, this is a good one, and I, I feel like this is different across the ages, but when should someone worry about a possible shunt infection, and when should it be time to go to the doctor? Um, shunt infection is less common than shunt malfunction. Um, many shunt infections um, are, are actually going to occur um, due to one of two things. Um, most infections occur um, because a shunt needs to be revised for some reason, and you can get bacteria which contaminates the shunt by the surgeons having to go in and revise it. Those infections, um, not 100%, but most of the time are gonna present within the first three to six months after a shunt revision surgery. The other way a shunt can get infected um, is if there's uh, an infection in the bloodstream that happens. And that might happen, we call that sepsis. Um, and that might happen from a wound. It might happen from a urinary tract infection where somebody has gotten very sick and the infection is spread from the urinary system into the bloodstream. And so it is possible for a shunt to get secondarily infected uh, from a cause like that. But other than those two things, um, uh, I, if, if somebody got an infection in the um, belly for some reason, in the abdominal cavity, uh, which we would call peritonitis, then that would be another way that the shunt could be seeded. But most of the time, it's going to, it's going to become infected um, because it has needed to be revised um, or because um, 
an infection has spread from some part of the body into the bloodstream, and so it's circulating in the bloodstream. I would be much more concerned about monitoring for shunt malfunctions than I would infection. Yeah. Um, maybe that's maybe that's what she meant. A mal signs of a shunt malfunction too. Um, which what what the top what are the top like three obvious signs? It it varies from age. Um, in infants, um, because the bones are not fully fused in the skull, you'll tend to see a rapid um, increase in head size. The fontanelle that you can feel in a newborn baby that's right about here on the head um, um, will often be bulging. You might see eyes um, that deviate downward. We call that sunset eyes. You might see changes um, such as extreme irritability where nothing consoles or extreme lethargy where they are very listless and not very responsive. Um, some of those same findings, the eye deviation, I see changes um, such as, oh, goodness. Um, I got an echo there from something. Um, the, um, in older children, they may have significant headache, which doesn't go away. Um, typically, the headache will be worse um, in the morning than it is through the day, but it really can happen any time of day. They may complain of vision changes. You might notice personality changes um, um, and the eye deviation again. Um, you may, uh, while the neurosurgeons will pretty much always do scanning, um, changes in the ventricular size are not always a reliable indicator that a shunt is malfunctioning. So they're gonna use imaging plus the presence of symptoms to make decisions. Um, and they might do other tests as well to try to determine shunt function. Um, sometimes a shunt can malfunction slowly. Um, and again, you might have personality changes or changes in learning ability uh, that happen and are more subtle. Those are more rare uh, for certain, but uh, have, have happened. Um, this is an interesting question. And I, I think I know the answer to this, but uh, Amara asks, do you, are there any documented cases or anybody that you know that has ever had a shunt removed? I wonder if other people have that question. Um, there are individuals who are reportedly um, have been reported in the medical literature as being shunt independent, that we know that there is a problem with the shunt, either a break in the tubing or something, um, and yet the person appears to be asymptomatic. We're not 100% sure why that is, um, and I think most neurosurgeons would say, would actually be in favor of not removing a shunt, even if it appears that it's not working um, and that the person doesn't seem to need it. Um, it may be that the, that the shunt tract under the skin is so well formed that the fluid still drains, even if the shunt has a, even if the shunt tubing has a hole in it or something. So, those reports exist. We're not sure how accurate they are. And we suspect that some of those individuals um, are not truly shunt independent. But I don't know of any neurosurgeon that would actually go in and take out a shunt, even if it seemed that that person was shunt independent. There's always a risk of that, of, of infection as well. So. Yeah. Um, a lot. Wow, a Amy said. Amy, who's from Greater New England, it said that her uh, son actually had a, a shunt for fourteen removes, uh, fourteen years, and had his removed and did ETV, doing well almost one year out. So maybe we'll see more of that as research goes on. But that might be a very independent, specific case. That may be an independent case, but also remember that ETV, endoscopic third ventriculostomy, is being done in some cases to 
in spina bifida to see if we can avoid doing a shunt. So that person had another procedure done to try to provide drainage without a shunt. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, this is an interesting question. And I, I wonder if other young parents or new parents might have this question because as we know, there's so much learning on the go. Um, her daughter is two years old, tethered cord um, and intermittent catheterization. She is mobile. She's able to go to the defecates on her own. So probably obviously not uh, cathing on her own. Um, she says they have a great urology team, but they wonder if they can ever expect her to gain the ability to urinate on her own. Should they seek a second opinion, which I'm assuming means the first opinion, they, the outlook was that she would probably not get that control. So I think it is rare if she is needing um, intermittent catheterization right now at age two. I think it is rare that, uh, to think um, that she would at some point become catheterization, uh, at some point to not need catheterization. If there's a difference with what her bladder is doing now, that they feel she needs catheterization, then um, the likelihood that she'll not need catheterization at some point in the future is very remote. Families can certainly seek a second opinion um, and um, depending on where you live, you could contact the National Resource Center at the Spina Bifida Association to get the names of other uh, reputable clinics that might be close to you. Um, but I think it's highly unlikely. Yeah. And just to add the emotional component of that, because I know there are some parents who might be very heartbroken to hear that, that um, this is a community that can be with you through that as your children grow up um, and that their cathing, no matter what type of cathing it is, um, Keep, keeps you independent and uh, we're, we're always here to help as are many friends in the community too. Um, I Can I just make a personal comment there as an adult with spina bifida? I have to catheterize every day. I have a bowel routine. I have a bladder routine I have to do. I think it can be heartbreaking to hear for a young family, but beginning to approach it and beginning to think of it as not normal or abnormal, but a different way to go, um, I think becomes important for parents to process and allows their children to begin to accept that as well. Mm -hmm. That's a personal opinion. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have some more um... I'm sure we'll get a lot of these catheterization questions. Uh, this is a specific one. This is from Kathy. She said, if her child's ACE is leaking at the opening during the day, is that a problem? Um, and should they see a doctor to address it? If so, what kind of doctor would address it? I, I'm sorry, I didn't get part of that question. Nora. If if your child's ACE, which is, is that's the enema, right? The, yeah. um, if it's leaking, uh, not when putting the water in, but all the other times, like throughout the day, is that a problem? Um, I would say I, um, there are ways that the, there are times that the ACE will leak. Um, and I would see the person, the surgeon who did it um, to see what the options would be. Okay. We generally, they try to make that stoma opening like a one-way valve um, so that you can put fluids through, but they, but they are trying to keep them from leaking out at other times, some of the mucus or whatever from leaking out. But if that's happening, I would suggest seeing the surgeon who did it or your team that deals with it where you are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, Here's a, another one. I'm not sure what the name of the surgery is, so you don't know. This is from Jessica. She says her daughter is 11 years old and her urologist is wanting to do surgery for her bladder. It would be the port through her belly button. Her daughter doesn't want to do this, but she wears diapers and does have issues with UTIs. So maybe this is another kind of like personal part too, where, where the, well, you can answer that. 
What type of surgery is that, first of all? Do you know? Or um, device? Um, um, so it would be called an appendicovesicostomy. Um, and it's, again, taking appendix or a different part um, and making an opening um, from the abdominal skin layer to the bladder for the purposes of, um, again, developing independence for catheterization. Um, and again, also depending, there may be other procedures that they're thinking of at the same time, um, either a bladder neck uh, procedure or something. Again, I don't have all the data, but that's what the surgery is. Um, again, it's very common to do, um, but uh, um, for some people, it ends up being the best choice if they're having recurrent infections. And I suspect that they're um, thinking at it from both the independent standpoint, but also the ability to maybe do bladder irrigations or things to try to reduce those infections. Okay. Um... I'm assuming this is this is a message that I got from a new parent. She she says that she sees a lot of comments and questions around tether cord surgery all the time on Facebook in the clinic. She wants to know what it is and why a child with spina bifida might have to have tethered cord surgery. I'm guessing that's probably not an issue for her yet, but so um Tethered cord is very interesting, and I will say that even among the medical professionals, there can be um, um, some difficulty in deciding whether or not somebody functionally has a tethered cord and, and when is it time to operate for that. Um, so what happens when the neurosurgeons close the back um, is that the spinal cord, they're just closing up the, the layers that would typically surround the spinal cord and then the skin layer. But there's not a way to 100% keep um, that area from, from developing a scar and attaching to the nerves. Um, and so we think that a tethered cord happens when a, a person is growing and the nerves are tethered, meaning stretched um, and can only move so far um, with growth. And, um, and then with that, if, if a person is developing symptoms, um, the the operation is to go in and essentially free up that nerve tissue again. Um, a tethered cord, by and large, is a clinical diagnosis. Um, if we look at MRI images of children with spina bifida, they almost all, from a structural or anatomic standpoint, will look tethered. Um, so we're not necessarily going by imaging alone, but the development of symptoms. Those symptoms are typically worsening of bladder function, um, worsening of bowel function, increasing foot deformities or the presence of increased muscle tone that we call spasticity, um, worsening foot deformities, back pain, radiating leg pain. Um, and um, typically, if a, if a tethered cord is um, called into question, then we're getting physical therapy evaluations looking at sensory and motor levels and any changes in the feet along with orthopedics. Um, and urology is typically doing repeat urodynamic testing to see what the bladder is doing. There are certain patterns of bladder dysfunction which appear to be more consistent with uh, symptomatic tethered cord. There are some individuals who never develop a symptomatic tethered cord in their life. There are other individuals that may develop it once 
or twice. I've seen three or four times. Um, and we don't know all of the factors uh, as to why that degree of variability. Wow, I did not know that. Um, that's good. I'm glad we covered the symptoms. I think a lot of people probably aren't as familiar with those. Because if you go to a spina bifida clinic, if you're if you're going to that clinic and you have symptoms of the tethered cord, chances are that those practitioners would catch that, right? So I think if you came in complaining of any of those things, that would be reason enough to start to, to do further evaluation. But the questions related to that are questions I ask at every clinic visit. Yeah, okay. Um, this is a good question. Um, so Jessica asks, she's asking about bracing, SMOs, AFOs, et cetera. Um, she says, it seems like opinions always seem to vary between doctors about what level of bracing is ideal when a kid is ambulatory and nerve function differences are more subtle. What is your opinion on the risk of over bracing versus under bracing if you have multiple differing opinions? So maybe she's getting a lot of opinions. Um, it's an interesting question, um, and I will tell you again, you can see a lot of different people um, and, and have different opinions. Um, so, so I would say there, there isn't always 100% consistency among orthopedists or rehab doctors as to bracing. Um, Typically, if you have mid lumbar function so that you have good quadriceps strength in the, the front muscles of your thighs, um, if you don't have much in the way of foot movement, typically we're going to use some kind of AFO for that. Um, and I would say AFOs are the most common. There are a couple of different types of AFOs, including what we would call a standard set of AFOs. There are some AFOs uh, that are called floor reaction or ground reaction AFOs that have a piece of plastic on the front of the AFO. You kind of slip them on um, through the back. Um, those AFOs are done primarily to help decrease the amount of crouch gait. Crouch gait is if you're walking, how much bend do you have in the knees? Um, and the AFOs are, the ground reaction AFOs are designed to try to decrease some of that crouch. Um, in the short term, uh, at that level of lesion, it may not make much difference. But again, for long term joint stability, um, and decreasing uh, um, issues of joint pain or early onset arthritis, we're trying to make a gait as normal as we can, uh, knowing that we can't make it perfectly. Um, some people uh, need AFOs and, um, and forearm crutches. Um, now, I'm old and gray now, but um, but I have to use forearm crutches in order to walk now because I do have arthritic knees. Um, and using forearm crutches helps provide some stability um, and, and decreasing um, stress on, on the joints of the, of the legs. If you, have, if you have weak quad strength or very little quad strength, then you're going to need um, a KAFO, knee ankle foot orthosis, which comes above the knee, or you might even need a hip uh, knee ankle foot orthosis, HKAFO, um, or an RGO, um, if you have a higher level and don't have much leg function. Um, I have relatively few uh, kids in my clinic that I follow that can get by with um, lower bracing than an AFO. I do have some, and those are typically called SMOs, supermalleolar. They come up over the ankles. Um, but, but you pretty much have to be a sacral level function 
or very, very low lumbar function for those to be appropriate. Okay, I, you know, the other thing that comes to mind too is that if, I mean, um, different orthopedic doctors at different hospitals might have different advice, right? But ideally, you should make sure you're seeing an orthopedist that has specialty with spina bifida if it is that much of a concern. Correct. Right, yeah, okay. Um, uh, Amy asked a question earlier that I wanted to come back to. It was about tethered cord again. It was if she, uh, how, I think her son has a spinal fusion and the question is, if you have spinal fusion, how can you tell if it's tethered cord? So maybe she means like, how could you tell if it's tethered cord? What are the symptoms of tethered cord if you have a spinal fusion? I'm assuming those are, well, you can answer that. Um, so it depends on the level of function that a child has. Um, if they don't have lower extremity movement or deformity, then it may be harder to tell. Again, you may get some changes in, in bladder function, more urinary tract infections, more leakage between catheterizations. Um, pain might still happen, um, but it can be it can be more challenging if if um, a spinal fusion has occurred. That I think takes an experienced team to follow. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, here's another specific question. This is from Kristen. She says her son's hips are out. He's 14 years old and very unbalanced. He wears a huge, oops, sorry, lift on his left leg. He has scoliosis and has had surgery, but it didn't work. At what point should we consider putting his hips and bones back in their sockets? Um, again, you'll get some variation of opinion. So I'm not an orthopedist, so I want you to take this with a bit of a grain of salt. But we know that children with spina bifida can have hips that are out of socket. We call them sub subluxed or dislocated. Um, and it doesn't seem to matter um, with their mobility or other kinds of things. The challenge about trying to do surgery to put hips back in place is that what keeps the hips in place is the counterbalance of muscles around the hip and which muscles are working and which muscles are not working. Um, if you don't have the ability to really get a good counterbalance of mus muscle function around the hip, um, then the chances that putting the hip back into place surgically um, are going to keep it in place are pretty small. Um, so there's been a huge decrease nationally of orthopedic surgeons who feel that putting the hips back into place becomes worthwhile. Um, if the um, it becomes important to work with your orthopedics team, though, about what we call the pelvic tilt or pelvic obliquity when they're sitting, because we don't want too much weight to be in one area of the bottom, um, which might lead to an increased likelihood of pressure sores. So making sure that um, your son has a seat cushion, which is definitely pressure relieving, um, and working with your team to get his um, orthopedic things as balanced as possible uh, in sitting is important. But um, surgeons became dissuaded from putting the hips back into place because they kept coming back out. So it all relates to the muscle control around the hips. Yeah. So that I'm sure obviously they have somebody, an orthopedist who specializes in spina bifida or has a strong focus in spina bifida. But um, Kristen, if you do need someone 
who specializes more in spina bifida, if you don't have that, we, we might be able to connect you with someone through our National Resource Center too. Um, okay, Tim, here, here's another, I think this is a good one because I, I feel like we get a lot of questions around surgeries all the time. So Matea says her daughter is 11 and they're getting ready to fuse her back. Do you have any advice and do you worry I think she's worried that she's too young. Do you think she'd be too young at 11? Um, so I'm making the assumption that um, there's a significant scoliosis present um, and that severity has reached a point where they feel some procedure is necessary. Um, so sometimes if, um, if surgeons have to do something, they'll, they'll um, do um, um, rods that they can um, expand or change or do a device that they call a vector. I never remember what that stands for. Um, that's a, a device that they have to go in and replace it periodically um with growth if your child has undergone puberty um, and has had periods then there's less of a likelihood that there's going to be significant bone growth yet um, so again it would be working with your surgeon and and discussing what are the options at this stage um, and um, the pros and cons of those. So if children have not, are not fully bone mature, have not gone through puberty, um, then they might do a, some, some temporizing procedure and trying to hold off on doing a definitive fusion. Um, I just want you to know you're getting a, a lot of comments from your old friends at Riley. <laughs> Hi all. Yeah, Doctor. For those of you that don't know, Doctor Bry used to work at Riley Children's Forever, and and then he is now at Seattle Children's. Um. Okay. Well. Um. I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna close out. I we went over kind of like our, our half hour. I know we said we could go an hour, but um. Uh. I I want people to know Doctor Bry is uh, is our medical director. Help. I'll, I'll um. So if you. If you do ever find yourself um, wanting to talk to him or ask him a question, um, you can certainly do that because that is part of his job with us at SBA. Um, he is fantastic and is very timely and um, is very good at, at answering questions as they come in through our National Resource Center. So you can always go to SBA's website and look for National Resource Center, or you can just email sbaa at sbaa.org. And Juanita, who works in our National Resource Center, can pass along your questions to Dr. Bry and um, our other medical director, Dr. Diciano. Um, we, she also might have the answer for you ready to go. Uh, but Dr. Bry will also probably be making an appearance at our upcoming Education Day for parents of children with spina bifida. Um, so if you, liked his answers tonight or you felt that you got some good information you can absolutely register for that uh it's next month and you can an easy way to find it is just by going to our facebook events linked here on our facebook page um dr bry why i think it might be kind of cool since you have like a lot of professional and personal experience to like leave with like a, a billboard message for the good of the group or something something that you want parents to know. I feel like we kind of talked about this when we did your awareness month interview last year. You had a lot of good messages for parents in there. So another tip, parents, if you want to hear more from Dr. Bry, if you go to our Facebook videos, you can see his full story um, in our Facebook videos. But why don't you, you know, leave something fun for the group? Um, gosh, um, a single pearl of wisdom. Um, is challenging for me. Um, so I think um, depending on the stage that you're at as a parent, um, things get challenging. And we worry a lot about the medical things and that's a lot of my job. 
but you also have a lot of other things going on. Um, and you have to navigate schools and 504 plans and IEPs. Um, and you have to navigate the medical systems. And even though we try to have um, good clinics, that can still be challenging. And you have to navigate building friendships and social activities. Um, and so one of the things that I think is important is um, give yourself some grace. Um, and um, we only can do the best we can. Do reach out to the Spina Bifida Association or your local Spina Bifida chapter if you feel that you need help with something. Um, I think the other thing is that it's important that we think consciously uh, about um, I'm a developmental pediatrician, so this is this is. I think it's important that we think consciously about development, and understand how development may be different in spina bifida because of difference in mobility, or how their brain learns, um, and that we try to build as many typically developing activities as we can, um, and and. Um, um, developmentally appropriate activities as we can. Um, it can be as simple as making choices in what shirt somebody wants to wear, or do you want the blue pants or the red pants, or um, teaching them, even though they're not physically going to be capable of catheterization at four, um, what are the materials you have to use? You talk through what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, and taking those little opportunities every day um, because the steps you, we build along the way help promote independence when they get to be adults. Um, and that's really uh, my prime goal. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great advice. Good job. That was awesome. Um, I should also note, because we do have some adults who wanted to ask you questions that we are going to do and ask the expert with um, the Associate Medical Director, Dr. DiCiano, in just two weeks. Dr. Bry is pediatrics, even though he has a lot of experience with adults with spinal because he is one and also he knows a lot. Um, but Dr. DiCiano is going to do one specifically for adults with spinal bifida. So if you have questions, you can save them for them. Um, and the recording for the Adults with Spina Bifida Education Day that happened uh, last month is available right now to, to purchase if you would like it. Um, and you can always message us and we can send you a link for it. Um, but thanks so much, Dr. Bry. It's always great to show your face here. And I'm sure the community really likes to see, see the, the man behind the director title here at SBA. So, yeah. Thank you, everyone. It's been fun. Yeah. All right, everyone. I hope it was useful. <laughs>